This is Space Time, Series 27, Episode 97, for broadcast on the 12th of August, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, the solar system's origins revealed. It now looks like Starliner's crew could remain stranded on the space station until next year. And busy times aboard the orbiting outpost with all docking bays full. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. An analysis of asteroid samples brought to Earth by NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has shown that our solar system was created in the wake of a nearby supernova explosion. Supernovae mark the spectacular death of stars. These blasts of matter and energy are so powerful they can briefly outshine an entire galaxy. Samples of the 4.6 billion-year-old asteroid Bennu brought back by OSIRIS-REx show that it's among the most chemically primitive materials known. The findings, reported in the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science, is among a host of new discoveries uncovered by researchers as they delve deep into the hidden secrets of this ancient 490-metre-wide relic. The OSIRIS-REx sample return mission was launched back on the 8th of September 2016, rendezvousing with the asteroid Bennu two years later on December 3, 2018. The probe spent the next two years analysing the primitive space rock's rugged, boulder-strewn surface, before briefly touching down on October 20, 2020, just long enough to grab a sample of rocks and regolith before returning to orbit. OSIRIS-REx finally left Bennu's space on May 10, 2021 for the three-year return journey to Earth, providing scientists with a treasure trove of data and pristine samples. You see, unlike asteroid samples collected from Earth's surface in the form of meteorites, these samples from OSIRIS-REx were uncontaminated by Earth, by its atmosphere, its biosphere, or the journey through space to get here. Bennu was chosen as the target for the study because it was considered by astronomers to be a time capsule from the birth of our solar system. Bennu is a carbonaceous C-type asteroid. These are considered extremely primitive, having undergone little geological change from the time of their formation. Its dark surface is composed of pristine carbonaceous material. That's a key element in organic molecules necessary for life, as well as being representative of the sort of matter that existed before the formation of the Earth. Organic molecules, such as amino acids, have previously been found in meteorite and comet samples, indicating that some ingredients necessary for life can naturally be synthesized in outer space. The Bennu samples consisted of mostly dark particles, ranging in size from dust grains to some more than 3.5 centimetres long. Researchers identified some lighter particles scattered through the samples, some with stones also having brighter material forming veins and crusts. One of the scientists studying these priceless Bennu samples is Associate Professor Nick Timms from Curtin University. Timms says the first findings from these samples revealed some real surprises. He says it's clearly undergone different processes to the planet. Analysis of the samples also confirmed the presence of various components previously thought to be present, things like hydrated phyllosilicates, that's a type of mineral which forms in the presence of water, as well as carbon-rich material. This means asteroids like Bennu may well have played a key role in delivering water and the building blocks of life to the Earth. But the samples also contain several unexpected components, including magnesium sodium phosphates, which further suggest that Bennu has experienced chemical environments that could possibly involve water. And there were other trace minerals, which offer clues as to the processes which happened on Bennu over billions of years, such as temperature and pressure conditions. These trace minerals are helping to paint a picture of Bennu's evolution, and they offer insights into the early solar system, how the different planetary bodies in the solar system were created, and how different parts of our solar system evolved. And it doesn't end there. Bennu also contained pre-solar grains, samples which were remnants created before our solar system existed, and which could provide a detailed biography of the lives of ancient neighbouring stars. 
Tim says when examined as a whole, these Banu samples will provide a wide range of implications for better understanding the science of the early solar system. We were one of the um, first members of the international team to receive some material from the latest asteroid sample return mission, uh, material from asteroid Bennu. What does it look like? The sample that was returned, the entire sample, comprises of small fragments a few centimeters across right down to really, really tiny dust particles and everything in between. They look like little dark balls of soil, I guess. They're very, very dark. There are some white and transparent bits in there as well that we can see. And they're very, very soft and friable and very delicate sample. What did you find? Well, between the entire sample analysis team, we found out quite a lot at the moment. So first of all, we found out some things that really corroborate uh, what the telescope observations could make, both from Earth and also when the spacecraft was orbiting the asteroid. And so far as it's got an appreciable amount of water in it, and just less than one weight percent water, and it's quite carbon rich as well, almost 5% carbon rich. So that means we can link to the telescope observations with the sample observations and it lends a bit more confidence to how we can classify and and look at asteroids in deep space. But there are many other things that we found out as well. We've looked at the bulk composition, so the abundance of all of the elements that we know, and it's got a very, very unique bulk composition in terms of the abundance of elements, very, very similar to that of the photosphere of the sun. Uh, We've also looked at some of the mineral components in there as well, and there's quite a lot of very interesting small particles of minerals. We're finding more about these things all the time. And also we found out there are some organic particles in there as well, things called nanoglobules, which are sort of made of a sort of one to four ring chains of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and they are allowing us to make some interesting conclusions too. What sort of conclusions are you drawing from the samples that you've got? Well, some of the particles in there, if we look at the detailed composition of them, the isotopes within them, they're not like what we find in our solar system. And these very rare particles are actually sourced from before our solar system existed from exotically from other other solar systems. So these are pre-solar so, grains, wow. Yeah, pre, pre-solar grains, exactly that right. Means yeah, so. That means they're more than 4.6 billion years old. They've got to be some of the oldest things we've ever seen. Yeah, that's right. Um, And from the compositions of them, we can tell what kind of star that star system that they came from. Um, We're finding more and more all at the time, but for the first publication, we've found seven. Some of the most are from particular stars, and one looked like it was from a supernova, so uh, that's really interesting. And there are also lots of minerals in there that are surprising us, things that we didn't expect to see, as well as things that we did expect to see. The idea that you've got pre solar grains from supernovae that supports the the theory that uh, or the hypothesis that our solar system was formed following a, a supernova explosion that bumped a lot of gas together. Uh, sure well the, I mean the formation of, of the sun and then the protoplanetary disk of the clouds of, uh, of, of gas and dust that formed after that are pretty much the primary ingredients for much of what we see in this asteroid. So the pre-solar grains are very rare but most of the material is from the disk from the sun. How do you know what a pre-solar grain is? Is it a case of dating? Is that how you determine, or has it got unusual chemical compositions that simply don't exist in our solar system? Yeah, they are discovered usually from very unusual compositions. So we can measure the isotopes of things like carbon and nitrogen, and solar, or things from our solar system, are very predictable. They have almost identical ratios of these different isotopes, but the pre-solar grains have got very strange and wayward isotopic compositions that we can't explain from the generation of our own sun. So that would be because different stars have different chemical makeups, they've evolved to different levels? Yes, that's that's kind of uh, along the right lines exactly. And you've also found some stuff which supports the idea that the Earth may have got its water from asteroids. For a long time, the hypothesis was that, oh, well, the Earth got its water from comets. But we now know that can't be true in all cases because the hydrogen deuterium ratios don't work out. What have you been able to find with Bennu? Uh, so we with Bennu, we're still working on the compositions from Bennu, but certainly from other asteroids that we've looked at. We've looked at tiny particles from Itakawa, and the, the composition of the hydrogen deuterium ratio looks to be matching that of Earth. And the way that the hydrogen got into those samples was actually a consequence of a, a implantation from the sun, like a solar irradiation. So on one hand, it's interesting to think that asteroids delivered some of the water that we have on Earth, or a lot of it, 
maybe. And on the other hand, it's interesting to think that the sun was actually the, the source of, of some of the hydrogen that forms the water on Earth as well. So that's really interesting. How do you actually perform these tests? So we look at the particles under quite high-powered instruments, microscope and different probes. So usually that involves firing an electron beam or even an, an ion beam at samples and then collecting signals that return from those. So we have to prepare the samples in very particular ways and avoid contaminating them with, with water and, and other fluids so we can get the, the pristine signal back from samples. But yeah, we've got a range of different analytical techniques that we can employ and we have been using. One of the interesting things about Bennu was that when a Sarus rex went for its sample, it almost got buried. If it didn't have an automatic system where it would launch again once it's collected a sample, it would have been buried under the surface. That's how loose the surface was. Sure. So Bennu, like other predecessor missions to other asteroids, to Itakawa and to Ryugu, all three of the asteroid sample return missions, all three of those asteroids have been discovered to be piles of rubble, which kind of, it sort of flies against kind of almost childhood notion of what asteroids look like, which are basically single solid pieces of rock. And so the more and more we discover in the solar system that these rubble pile asteroids are quite common. And one reason for that is, well, they formed from catastrophic events that disrupted the parent body from which the asteroid was formed. And, but the other thing is, it means that they are mechanically and, and physically, they behave quite differently. Like you said, this space craft almost disappeared into the surface of Bennu. Uh, it's quite soft, I guess quite absorbent when it comes to uh, absorbing hits and shock and things like that. So that has huge consequences for how these asteroids behave. Well, they, for example, defense, when, yeah, yeah for, for, from when we, you know, if they pose a threat to the Earth, also for how long they hang around in the solar system for as well. And in terms of if one collides with another, what the mechanical properties of those things will actually result in, whether they'll be destroyed or whether they can absorb those kinds of impacts. So. If you fire a gun at a solid rock, the gun will possibly deflect the rock. It'll move it to one side. But if you fire that same gun at a pile of rubble, the rubble doesn't actually move. It absorbs the, the bullet and it's still doing what it was doing before, which means if we're talking about an asteroid, that asteroid will continue on the path it was on previously. That's the yeah, that's, defense issue. Yeah, that's a distinct possibility. It has a big implications for planetary defense. But having said that, NASA did launch uh, a mission to try and deflect an asteroid. Um, this is DART. The DART mission. And that deflection was caused by the spacecraft actually traveling into the asteroid of, of a, a binary system. So there are two asteroids orbiting each other and the, the asteroid deflected. Yeah. They deflected the asteroid quite successfully. So, yeah, there's still a lot to learn about exactly how these bodies behave as we find more and more of them and we try and understand the threat that they might pose to Earth. What I found fascinating about Bennu was that it was so similar in appearance to Kaigu. They were both very cube-shaped. And that's very different to Itakawa, which was more like a potato in shape. Yeah, exactly. So they are very peculiar shapes. They're sort of like... Uh, double cones or, or spinning tops, I guess. And they do have quite a lot of topography on their surface. Some of those look like they are places where there have been impact, but there are significant boulder fields and, and everything right down to the tiniest dust particles. They're very difficult places to try and sample and try and land on. But yeah, the shapes of them are quite different. And so Ryugu and Bennu are, are most similar to each other, like you say, but Itakawa, yeah. I think they would, would call it the, the, the peanut in space. Yes. It's a very unusual shape. I don't know if you've had a chance yet to read the, the five papers that have come from the DART team in the last week or two. They've shown that it could be that Dimorphos, which is the moon orbiting Didymos, Dimorphos may have been created by boulders and rubble being flung off Didymos. That's how it may have formed. That's a distinct possibility. And so one thing that we're trying to find out is exactly when did these asteroids form? How long have they been in the solar system? Have they moved in their positions from one place in the solar system to another? Have they been destroyed and, and re reformed many times or are they just ancient relics from the earliest part of the solar system? And so that's one thing that we're trying to do with our analyses of the samples that have come from Bennu and Ryugu. Um, we have various analytical techniques to date some of the particles in there and some of the dating techniques are very susceptible to changes in temperature 
atmosphere and so on. So if the impact has happened and the asteroid's been heated up, we should be able to see that in the data that we acquire. I remember a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away when I was working for a lesser radio station, one of the studies that I reported on, it was a meteorite sample. They were able to tell that it was originally formed through an impacting event in the main asteroid belt and then travelled to the outer solar system around the uh, Kuiper Belt area before coming back in again. So it was formed, extreme stress, high heat event, froze out in the distant solar system and then came back in again to where it eventually slammed into the Earth. So these asteroids, they can go on quite wondrous journeys. Yeah, the, I mean, all of these things are in, within the realms of possibility. So it's going to be really interesting to see what results we get. And I think the dynamicists of, of modelled asteroids such as Ryugu and Bennu, and they are proposing that these things are, have been destroyed and reformed at least twice before. So that provides us a, a, a good hypothesis to try and test with our data that we can get from the actual samples themselves. In October, the European Space Agency will launch the HERA mission. That, again, is going to uh, Didymos and Dimorphos. Is that something you're looking forward to? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm not part of that mission, but it's going to be very interesting to see what they, they find out. Where to now? What's the next thing to be done? The next thing to be done? One of the big things that we're really looking forward to is actually looking at some of the bigger particles from Bennu. So far, we've only been looking at the, the very fine-grained aggregate of particles and not some of these larger centimetre-sized bits. And because we can get quite a lot more out of those, we can look at all of the, the spatial relationships of all of the components in there and look at the textures. And that, that can tell us a hell of a lot more about um, how these things are formed and evolved over time. How does it feel to know that you're changing the world, humanity's view of our solar system and the evolution of, of the solar system? I mean, that's pretty significant. Well, it's, it's quite humbling, really. Um, it's not something I ever imagined myself being part of, but it's it's incredible to be right at the forefront of um, the science of, of this, and, and it's a, it's quite, it feels like quite a privilege to be involved in these quite exciting and quite rare missions. And hopefully these things can continue into the future as we explore deep space and get to grips with exactly our place in the solar system and, and how we, we all came to be and how we, the Earth came to be. That's Associate Professor Nick Timms from Curtin University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, it now looks like Starliner's crew could be stranded on the International Space Station until 2025. And it's a busy time aboard the orbiting outpost, with no less than six spacecraft currently docked there. All that and more still to come on Space Time. There are growing fears that the crew of Boeing's trouble-plagued Starliner spacecraft could remain stranded aboard the International Space Station until next year. NASA officials are now openly speculating that Starliner astronauts Butch Wiltmore and Sonny Williams could wind up returning to Earth on SpaceX's Crew Dragon in February 2025 if Starliner is still deemed unsafe. The space agency's been looking at leaving two seats empty on the upcoming SpaceX Crew Dragon 9 mission to the orbiting outpost. That flight, which was to launch this month carrying four crew members for the space station, has now been pushed back till September because Starliner is occupying the docking port the Crew Dragon was meant to use. NASA says that SpaceX Crew 9 mission isn't slated to return to Earth until February next year meaning the Starliner crew's initial eight-day mission could balloon out to more than six months if the decision's taken to abandon Boeing spacecraft in favour of the Dragon. Previously, NASA and especially Boeing have dismissed suggestions that the pair could wind up being rescued by competitor SpaceX. Boeing says its confidence remains high in Starliner returning with the crew. But if that doesn't happen, they'll simply reprogram Starliner for an unmanned return-to-Earth flight. Starliner was launched from Cape Canaveral back on June the 5th aboard an Atlas V rocket on what was meant to be an eight-day shakedown flight, the first carrying a crew. However, a combination of ongoing helium leaks and sudden faulty thruster issues hampered the flight to the space station, eventually forcing a manual docking rather than the automated arrival originally planned. Helium is an inert, non-combustible gas. It's used to pressurise the spacecraft's propulsion systems. 
The helium leaks aboard Starliner were first detected prior to the launch, but they weren't considered serious enough to abort the mission. That's because the spacecraft carries 10 times more helium than it needs. But as the mission progressed, the leaks became worse and more numerous, with four more developing. NASA and Boeing have been trying to replicate the problems on the ground using a spare Starliner service module at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. They think the helium leaks could be caused by degrading seals due to oxidizer permeation. As for the thruster issues, well, they began later in flight, once Starliner was already in orbit. Starliner uses 28 thrusters as part of its reaction control system for fine orbital manoeuvring. But during the flight, Starliner's computers suddenly deselected five of the thrusters and a propellant valve also failed to close properly. White Sands testing indicates the thrusters failed because they overheated and automatically shut down. The crew were eventually able to bring four of the thrusters back online manually and then complete their docking to the space station's Harmony module. As they approached the space station, the crew also noticed that other thrusters appeared to be weaker than normal. It's all raising some disturbing issues. Once again, it was tests on the ground which came to play. They identified degradation issues in both fuel and liquid oxygen valves. Teflon was discovered eroding from the seals, causing ejector poppets to clog and deform. Now, mission managers are stressing the problems are only affecting thrusters controlling orientation, not the more powerful ones used for deorbiting. And they believe the remaining thruster seals should remain intact long enough for the return journey. Mission managers have been looking at using alternative orbital manoeuvring thruster firing sequences for the re-entry, descent and landing. They've also determined that as a precaution, there will be no manual flying of the spacecraft on the return journey. All of it will be automatic so as to avoid any undue stress on the system. None of this should be surprising. Boeing have had ongoing problems with Starliner for years. The spacecraft's first unmanned orbital test flight back in December 2019 was a total disaster. It failed to reach the space station for a planned docking because a timing clock on one of the computers had launched it into orbit at too low an altitude. It was then discovered that another computer, the one involved in the automatic docking procedure, wasn't working properly anyway, so even if the spacecraft had reached the space station, it wouldn't have been able to dock there. And finally, a third computer program was also found to be faulty. And this one was a real doozy. It would have changed the firing sequence between the jettisoning of the command module and the service module. Instead of pushing the two apart, it would have caused the service module to crash into the command module, destroying both modules. Luckily, that one was discovered before EDL, in other words, entry, descent and landing. Now, most of these problems were linked to computer failures and programming errors. An investigation by NASA found more than 80 issues which needed to be addressed before Starliner could fly again. Finally, a second unmanned orbital test flight was carried out in May 2022. Now, it went a lot better with only some minor issues. However, once back on the ground, propulsion system corrosion issues, parachute strengthening requirements and concerns over the fire resistance of electrical cabling installation were all uncovered, pushing the first manned test flight back by over two years. And we now know how well that's gone. Now, by comparison, Boeing's competitor, SpaceX's Dragon capsule, has experienced fairly smooth sailing, so far carrying nine crews to the International Space Station since 2020, as well as several private manned orbital spaceflights. NASA says that shows the advantage in developing two separate spaceflight systems as part of their commercial crew contract project to develop spacecraft to ferry crew to the space station following the early retirement of the space shuttle fleet in 2011. While on station, the stranded Starliner team have been working with the seven Expedition 71 crew members, helping out with day-to-day tasks and scientific experiments. NASA say they expect to make a final decision on how the crew will return to Earth within the next few days. Needless to say, we'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, busy times aboard the International Space Station with all parking bays full. And later in the science report, a new study has shown that sea surface temperatures in the Great Barrier Reef are now the warmest they've been in 400 years. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
Well, it seems like rush hour aboard the International Space Station at the moment, with no less than six spacecraft currently docked to the orbiting outpost. In other words, every docking port is now full. The six spaceships include Boeing Starliner, SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavour, a Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo ship, the Soyuz MS-25 crew capsule, and both the Progress MS-27 and MS-28 cargo ships. Other than the trouble plague Starliner, the most recent arrival was the Russian Progress MS-28 cargo ship, carrying over two and a half tonnes of food, fuel and supplies. The Progress MS-28 had launched two days earlier aboard a Soyuz 2.1A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The Progress docked automatically onto the orbiting outpost Poisk module's space-facing Zenith port, where it will remain for the next six months. Ship's manifest included 1,290 kilograms of food, crew personal items and toiletries, and general supplies. There's also 420 kilograms of fresh water on board, 754 kilograms of rocket fuel propellant, and 40 kilograms of nitrogen. Once unloaded, it'll be used as a trash storage facility, being filled with garbage no longer needed by the crew before being deorbited and allowed to burn up together with its trash in the Earth's atmosphere. This is space time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. New observations show recent temperatures in the Coral Sea surrounding the Great Barrier Reef are now the warmest they've been in 400 years. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, show how climate change is putting the reef in danger. The study's authors found that sea surface temperatures in the January to March period for 2024, as well as 2020 and 2017, were the warmest on record. They also confirmed that it's human interference in the use of greenhouse gases which is driving the swarming effect. A new study has linked a common plastic with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorder in young boys. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder with a wide spectrum of behavioural and cognitive changes. It's known to result from a complex interaction between genetics and the environment, and the nature of the environmental interactions are still largely unclear. Now, a report in the journal Nature Communications has identified high levels of the chemical bisphenol A, also known as BPA, a plastic commonly used in food packaging. It was detected in urine samples taken from women pregnant with boys later found to have autism. The study involving 43 children suggested that male children who had low levels of the enzyme aromatase, that's an enzyme which converts brain androgens into brain estrogens, and a high exposure to BPA, were more likely to have autism diagnoses or autism spectrum behaviours. A new study warns that dugon numbers have been declining for a thousand years, and those in the western Indian Ocean have now lost their genetic diversity. A report in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science looked at ancient DNA from dugon specimens in museums and then mapped their genetic diversity in the Indo-Pacific. This was then used to model their past populations. The authors found that global dugon populations are becoming fragmented and less diverse, putting them at increased risk of inbreeding and therefore at greater risk of human activities and climate change. Now, most of you have probably noticed a big sports carnival happening in France at the moment. And the more observant of you may even have noticed some of the strange, superstitious rituals some athletes undertake for or during competition. Well, the good news is not all sports-minded people fall for these magic lucky charms and rituals. But as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out, there are enough high-profile ones that do to influence impressionable people. Well, it's interesting to see if athletes are more prone to these things than other people. Okay, because athletes, are especially high-profile, you see them all the time. And therefore, you see them do this little thing how many times uh, Rafael Nadal bounces the ball, scratches his nose behind his ear, etc. People are wearing particular clothing. It applies across virtually every sport. There are people who sort of have little kicks and gear or things. They use twinkly fingernails, etc., that they think will 
give them an advantage. Now, there's various reasons for this. One, that in the sporting world, a split-second advantage can be mean any, everything. You look at the swimmers who are getting down to hundreds of seconds. Anything that they might see might give them an advantage is worthwhile trying. Also, the fact that they also might be off-putting other people. I would suggest that Raphael's bouncing of the ball all the time, really annoying <laughs> to the tennis player at the other end of the court. And the grunting and the all the things they do. Okay, are sports people more prone to this sort of stuff? I think that's a, a very difficult question. We covered it a lot in our magazine, if I can give it a plug, the March 2022 issue uh, had a lot of articles on superstition in sport, looking at the various things they do and why they do it. The classic example is Djokovic, who's regarded as one of the best tennis players ever. He's notorious for his the things that he's sort of uh, followed up on. Everything from magic mountains to different foods and, and crystals and you name it. So he's been at a lot of things, actually. Um, other athletes are not, quite frankly. There are a lot of athletes who don't fall to this sort of stuff, whether it's an alternative medical treatment, a magic crystal, nothing to wear, a process you do, a little uh, rigmarole that most sports people don't, you can say, or at least we don't know that they do, but it's not sort of overtly. I mean, yeah, when you have cupping on your back, it shows up, right? All these little round marks that people do. No indication that that helps, but never mind. Are sports the people more... The thing they really do, these sorts of things, is give you more confidence, and that, yeah. that's important. That's important too, and that might be yeah, enough reason for them to do it, but the trouble is it influences other people to think that is the thing that works rather than the confidence building. Any advantage they can get, especially in those sports where there's a, a minimal and tiny time issue or a height issue or whatever, a difference between coming first and coming second, they will try. Well, some will try. Now, whether that's just a confidence thing, they think it works, or whether it's just um, a superstition. The question is, how many do it? Most don't do it, okay? A lot of sportsmen do do it, but they're high profile and you can see them. So, yeah, they're in the media, so you can see them do it. But what the problem is, it encourages lesser athletes, young athletes coming up to think, I don't have to work so hard, I can just get cupping, right? Or I can put a wristband on, or I can sort of uh, go through a ritual. So the issue is, okay, one, is it going to help them? Unlikely, except for a confidence booster. Do they do it because they want the maximum advantage they can get, whether it's the colour of their clothes or whether whatever it is, you can understand they do it. If they're multi-million dollar athletes out there, you can probably reason to do it. Is it going to help them? No. Is it influencing other people? Yes. And that's where it really becomes a bit of a problem, that uh, people think it's a shortcut to success, and it ain't. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 